Uh, this is the agenda for today. We're going to first hear a little bit about the RWFI and have some updates about some funding opportunities that are coming around the bend uh, associated with energy and advanced manufacturing workforce. Um, and also hear some progress about one of the funding opportunities we were able to be part of with the Appalachian Regional Commission late last year. Uh, then we'll go into talking about blockchain R&D with Sydney. Uh, and then finally, we'll end with the short Q&A session. So, without further ado, Anthony. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Anthony Armley. I am the federal coordinator of the Regional Workforce Initiative. I'm based at our Pittsburgh campus uh, of NETL. So, I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown of what our Regional Workforce Initiative is, uh, an update on a project we were involved in last year and then some some funding opportunities that might be of interest to you all so the regional workforce initiative uh, we started this in 2017 it aligned with the administration's priorities to connect r d investment uh, in order to promote job growth economic growth and development of a skilled technical workforce uh, this is a platform where we engage and collaborate with uh, workforce economic development and education stakeholders uh, we call it play space we're focusing on the appalachian region um, you know, NETL is the fossil energy and carbon management laboratory. Uh, so, you know, coal, oil, natural gas technologies, fossil energy, carbon management type stuff. Um, it fits that Appalachian region where we have a vast uh, array of, of resources right here in our backyard. Um, in the past year, we've catalyzed over a million dollars in, in funding for workforce development. And I'm going to talk to you about that today as far as an update goes on that project. Since inception, uh, some key metrics, uh, we've engaged with over 800 different stakeholders that represent over 400 uh, organizations or, or institutions that can be industry, academia, other labs, et cetera. Our webinar series, which today is, is part of our Energy 101 series, we've had over 1,200 re uh, registrants in the past year on our different webinars. And we have a monthly e-note. If you're not subscribed, uh, send me an email or go to www netl.doe slash rwfi and there's a button to opt in so our e-note comes out once a month talks about high level newsworthy items coming out of our lab funding opportunities uh, that you might be interested in any upcoming events we're going to have and then we also have a section about uh, workforce trends uh, so it's it's worth i think it's worth a look we have nearly 300 that, that register to that each month and we've had a lot of positive feedback uh, next slide please Key outcomes since inception, just the establishment of a new network of regional key stakeholders that we engage with consistently, uh, integration of a workforce work plan. So that's that's something that we did a pilot program last year where we took any technology at NETL three to five years from commercialization. We implemented a workforce work plan where the project manager or the technology manager would provide all the unique skills um, that that technology would need in order to support that if it was a job in the, in the market. And then we basically created a database where we incorporated all the data. We wrote a technical report about it. And our findings showed that the technologies that are being funded by the U.S. taxpayer and being developed in our lab have a very broad array of job opportunities that are needed to support these technologies uh, in the workforce. And so what that means is you don't just have to have a master's, a bachelor's, a doctorate to be able to, to have these jobs we need we need skilled we need a skilled workforce as well and uh, i think that was a positive we're trying to take this further and implement this this work plan across all of the labs and that's uh, i hope to have some more information on that in the coming months um, as we're working on that behind the scenes right now and just really the last key outcome that i've, I've found to be super beneficial is just the increased growth uh, the, the conversations that we've had with some of these stakeholders that have brought in new collaborative opportunities for our lab and, and really for others in the, in the region as well. Next slide, please. So this is this is the funding opportunity I talked about that we helped broker the deal between headquarters, Department of Energy, and the Appalachian Regional Commission. DOE sent $750,000 to ARC. ARC matched with another $250,000 to make the, the amount $1 million in support of an, an, of an advanced welding workforce initiative. So the idea behind this is they, they're looking to create a pipeline of qualified workers um, who can apply the latest and greatest uh, advanced materials, um, manufacturing processes, and different techniques to, to a 
higher level welding, advanced welding, if you will. And this aligns with NETL's Advanced Materials Lab um, that we have on that we have in Albany, Oregon. So in addition, the, the plan for this is to support manufacturing for careers in the energy, automotive, aerospace, aviation, and petrochemical industry. So advanced welding touches a lot of different industries. Um, and then it, it's really, it was designed to help enroll displaced workers, people that are new to the workforce to have an interest in welding, incumbent workers, individuals recovering from substance abuse, et cetera. And if you go to the next slide here, uh, you can see the metrics. There was five awards um, out of that million dollars to uh, tech schools or community colleges in, in five states, one in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, and Alabama. This, this $1 million program will support over 330 different students and 94 workers who are going to be either retrained or upskilled to a better or enhanced career. Uh, so currently, equipment's being bought, and some metrics that we just uh, were provided recently of, of a couple of the awards, Calhoun Community College indicator, they said there's more women enrolled now in this program, uh, their welding program, than in the past four years combined. So this funding is really helping to bring a diverse, uh, a diverse, unique person to this, you know, by having more women involved than ever in the past, well, in the past four years combined. Really happy about that. RCBI down in Huntington, West Virginia, they have two new cohorts of students who began this training, 20 students pre-registered. They've had more women than ever enrolled, another positive um, to this program that has been implemented. And then universally, universally in here too, there continues to be challenges for community colleges to maintain enrollment to levels that they had pre-pandemic. So we're trying to bring awareness to these opportunities um, in hopes of getting the enrollment back up to where it was and, and even better than ever before. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Some funding opportunities I wanted to highlight today. Uh, the first one is strengthening, strengthening community colleges, uh, which is a training grant. It's from the Department of Labor. The deadline for this grant is uh, beginning of June. Uh, they're looking to do two things, to increase the capacity and responsiveness of community colleges, to address identified equity gaps, and in addition, they're looking to help meet the skill development needs of employers. So working with industry on in-demand jobs and skills that are needed, uh, for career pathways as, well as, as far as developing those, ski, those skills um, further for under, undeserved and underrepresented workers. The other one is the Industry University Cooperative Research Centers Program. They're looking to have three primary objectives. The first one is to conduct high impact research to meet shared and critical industry needs, uh, no matter the size of the company. Uh, the second one is to enhance U.S. global leadership in driving innovative technology development and then the third uh, objective of this funding opportunity uh, that came from the Ni National Science Foundation is to identify, mentor, and develop a diverse, highly skilled science and engineering workforce. That aligns really well with our, our uh, RWFI initiative here. Um, if you have any questions about these funding opportunities that are, that are due uh, beginning of June, let me know and we could talk further. And then there's one more I wanted to talk about that just came out from the Department of Labor. Matt, if you go to the next slide. So Department of Labor, uh, just announced thir over $34 million in funding available for workforce development in the Appalachian region, as well as the Delta region, in that Arkansas, Mississippi, Louisiana area. Um, for rural communities, um, investing in projects providing career training and support services for quality jobs in high demand careers. A lot of funding out there uh, to improve our workforce in these areas, and, and I really I, I you know, I really recommend trying to take a look at it and see if there's an area you can go after under these there's different topic areas that might align um, to each organization or each person. So if you have any questions about any of these funding opportunities, let me know, and I'd be happy to talk, talk to you further about them. And here's my contact information. You can email me, call me, and I'd be happy to talk anytime. So let's move forward to Sydney Cradle now for her Energy 101 presentation. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, so Sydney, uh, just give me a second to locate you. Sydney, you should be already on mute, uh, unmuted. And I'm can you hear me okay? Yes. We're making That's you the presenter right. right now. Okay. All right. Well, um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Anthony uh, and Matt for inviting me uh, to speak today and address this audience. Um, I'm, I'm excited uh, about uh, the research that we're doing here at NETL um, within this area uh, uh, alongside our, our other DOE partners as well. Um, so, you know, I just want to, I'm excited to share what we're doing, uh, basically, in your backyard uh, in this kind of Appalachian region. I'm sitting here in uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. It's a beautiful day uh, overall. 
So, um, you know, the, the name of the project uh, that we have is called uh, Blockchain for Optimized Security and Energy Management, or Blossom. And my name is Sydney Cradle, uh, and I'm the uh, co-PI for the project. And I also serve as a, a, a technology manager and an acting senior fellow right now at NETL. Um, so I, I wear multiple hats, and this is one of them. Um, and uh, this is a, a two-year project uh, that was initiated through um, the Grid Modernization Initiative. Um, you know, with the Department of Energy, and uh, our funding sponsors are the Office of uh, Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, the Office of Electricity, and the Office of Nuclear Energy. Uh, and it's, again, it's part of a grid modernization initiative, which basically, it, you know, is, is their mandate is to conduct R&D around the development of uh, a modern electric grid um, and all the associated infrastructure, you know, just to make sure it's uh, reliable, re resilient, and more secure. Uh, overall. Um, so uh, NETL, for this project, NETL is the lead institution. Um, and again, uh, there's multiple sites at NETL, but I just highlighted the Morgantown site where I'm sitting. Um, and uh, we've brought together, I think, you know, a powerhouse team of other national laboratories. Um, so we have, uh, as the co-lead institution is uh, NREL, uh, so the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And then uh, we have uh, also as a part of our DOE team, uh, SLAC, uh, National Accelerator Laboratory, as well as uh, Ames Laboratory and Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So again, it's a, it's a virtual dream team when it comes to partnering uh, overall and when it comes to blockchain expertise. Um, you know, I believe, you know, personally, I believe, you know, the folks on this team, they represent the best in terms of researchers within DOE in this area. Um, and again, the team has done all the work. So um, what I'm trying to do, I'll try to relay it to the best of my ability. I hope to do it justice because uh, again, I'm usually I uh, roll with you know six or seven people who are you know um, you know uh, working on different facets of the project. Um, but yeah, so uh, and again, if it, our uh, Blossom team members are in the in the uh, area, I might call on you maybe during the Q and A to maybe uh, if if we go deeper into some of the um, the weeds of what we're doing. So yeah, so that's the, the DOE team. And then we actually have an industry advisory board. Uh, so it's uh, about 10 to 12 organizations. Um, I won't name them all, but you know, we're very thankful um, to, you know, be, to call them a part of our extended team. And when we talk about industry advisors, like they, they actually have rolled up their shirt sleeves and worked with us for, you know, now again, we're into our last final two and a half months or so of a two year project. Um, and uh, you know, they've, they've been with us all along the way. And again, you know, we have uh, EPRI, IBM, we're using the um, IBM Hyperledger, which is a blockchain that they uh, produce. And then we have uh, other uh, uh, industry advisors like SoCal Edison and, and others. Okay, so just, you know, at a high level, you know, blockchain technology is, you know, basically it's, it allows you to store uh, transactions and information uh, in the form of blocks, right? And the blocks are linked with each other, um, one after the other, forming, you know, a chain uh, of, of blocks that is very hard to go in and change um, any specific portion. Um, so we think, you know, this blockchain technology is very decentralized in nature. We think it can be a, a, a game changer in terms of securing operations at grid scale. So we think the inherent features, so you know, are, are very compelling overall. Um, and, you know, so one, some of them being, you know, immutability, which is basically, you know, is a virtually a per permanent archive of information, um, you know, transparency. Uh, so, you know, it, it, because it's decentralized and everybody can access it, you know, you're able to trace information on the ledger uh, in a transparent fashion. Uh, through consensus, you know, again, you're, it's speaking to the fact that you have a decentralized network of um, uh, uh, entities that, you know, they agree on governance and the logic that dictates how the information be written. Um, so it's, uh, and then at the end of the day, it's also helping to secure data, you know, in transit, but also at rest through encryption. Um, so what does this all add up to, like overall? So to us, we think that, you know, the decentralized nature of a blockchain, you know, kind of removes that single point of failure um, in terms of attack, and it, it makes, operations more resilient uh, to attack. 
Um, and then, uh, well, in the face of the tax, excuse me. And then because it's a permanent record of, um, of transactions, it can open up a lot of um, opportunity in terms of operations, you know, because you have a complete auditability of uh, the full history of the blockchain, um, you know, such that you can detect when something's been tampered with um, overall. And then again, because of the way it's structured, you know, and, uh, it, there's no single uh, point of truth, right? So it's it's actually, or, or excuse me, it's decentralized. So there is a single uh, point of truth amongst a lot of all the different players um, between organizations as well as, um, you know, uh, uh, public networks as well. And then, you know, from an organizational pr perspective, you have the, the capability of choosing whether or not you want to be on a public blockchain or a private uh, ledger itself. And it's kind of similar to the internet, like you can have things that are on the open internet or you can have, you know, organizational wide uh, access controlled intranet where, you know, you can grant people access to information. So there's, again, there's public and private ledgers as well. So there's a lot of, um, of versatility and capability with blockchain. And again, the, the, the sum total allows you to increase uh, trust and data integrity of shared operations between multiple organizations overall. So, you know, uh, and, and anybody who knows me knows that I love this image on the right. <laughs> I use it everywhere. Um, basically, because it is kind of the story of our lives or uh, from a research perspective and a program perspective, you know, we're always thinking about, so I, I think of us as technology developers, and we're always thinking about how to um, get new technologies through uh, to become solutions out into industry. And again, on the right, you see this kind of, you start with a lot of different ideas, and then you have to, you know, not everything is viable, right? You, and the way you figure that out is through testing and demonstration. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the guiding principle that I've uh, been come to live by is that as you're trying to move these viable concepts up and out as solutions, um, you have to do meaningful real world testing. You have to demonstrate it, you have to shake it down, you know, you gotta put it through its paces to make sure that a, a given, a, a new innovation actually holds water, right? So um, when it comes to blockchain though, and again, testing is critical, but when it comes to blockchain, you know, we found that there aren't a lot of testing um, opportunities, right? Uh, you know, like if you have a concept or if you're a vendor, if you're if you created a blockchain, where do you even go to test it to be able to say, yes, this is a viable a solution, this is a, a, a viable technology overall? Uh, so, you know, what, because we saw that as a gap, we came together and said, we will create it. You know, we will create a test bed, um, you know, that uh, is uh, specific to grid applications um, that will allow folks to test not just um, blockchains, but also test out use cases on top of the uh, blockchain itself. So that's what we built. We built out a, a testing infrastructure uh, overall. So, and that brings us to the objective of the project. So our objective, just in kind of short uh, form here, is to create a multi-lab uh, unified testing platform. And we're gonna call it, we call it unified testing platform, the Blossom UTP. You might see us uh, use that UTP acronym throughout the, the presentation. So that's the platform itself. And, um, you know, we uh, will have that platform be able to um, emulate different aspects of the electric grid. So such that, you know, we could test and evaluate different concepts and solutions. And then uh, we seek to, to um, uh, 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 test it or, or, or put concepts under investigation in terms of compelling use cases. So the use cases themselves, they inherit, they leverage the inherent features of blockchain um, uh, in order to achieve secure communications overall. So we hope, um, you know, it'll help protect or, or defend, detect, and also mitigate cyber-based attacks. So once complete, you know, our testing capability will, we hope, it will serve as a proving ground for new concepts. Um, and again, one of the gaps that we see is 
you know, regarding like technology development and maturation of blockchain uh, concepts is the fact that, you know, it, it, there's a lack of real world meaningful testing <laughs> capabilities just in general. Um, so, and then we think in the doing, like once we have this site finished, we will be able to, I will always say, you know, uh, uh, drive down risk and increase the confidence in these concepts overall. And if we're doing that properly, we can then accelerate the pipeline of viable concepts that are going out into industry and going out uh, to, to help secure the grid overall. So, yes, yeah, so that's, that's the high level um, kind of snapshot of the work that we're doing. Um, and then just a little bit more information is uh, there's three main elements to the project. And the first element is the platform itself. So again, this is the, the kind of the baseline uh, testing infrastructure uh, that we're building out and it, we're trying to uh, uh, focus in on the modularity of it, the interoperability of it, you know, so that we can reconfigure, reuse it, um, and so that we can interface with uh, multiple blockchains, but also um, be able to conduct multiple use cases. And then, you know, to show that our platform is actually working in the way that in which we intend it, we actually are going to be demonstrating two use cases. So today I'm going to walk you through those use cases and I'll try to bring it to life a little bit. Um, but the first use case is <clears throat> uh, supply chain. Um, and then uh, the second one is uh, DER, so distributed energy resources, coordination and control. Um, so the uh, supply chain use case is basically you know, the objective there is to be able to um, use, use blockchain to be able to, to track the life cycle of assets um, from everything from ordering from a catalog all the way through to decommissioning and all the different steps uh, between that. And again, I'll go through this a lot more in subsequent slides. Um, and then the second use case is, again, DER for coordination and control. So this one is uh, to, to facilitate the um, operational communications between uh, distributed energy resources and um, aggregators, as well as um, uh, DSOs, uh, you know, to enable market participation uh, of new um, aggregator resources uh, in a way that it doesn't, you know, impact the uh, energy, uh, the grid itself. Um, so again, in subsequent slides, I'm going to walk you through this. So I'm actually going to start with the use cases and kind of build it back up. And then, you know, hopefully through walking through the use cases of what we're trying to demonstrate and what we're trying to test, you'll see the, the significance in the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, yeah, well, let's just leave that, that. You'll see the significance of what we're trying to build in terms of the platform uh, and, and the testing capability overall. So, yes, oh, well, before we get into that, I just want to, um, so, so the, to the, UCP, uh, again, Unified Testing Platform, uh, the core of it is, uh, uh, we, so you're going to see this kind of three panel structure throughout the presentation. <laughs> and um, at its core, you know, we're trying to be able to facilitate. So, so with, with these three panels, we have on the left side, we have the blockchain side or the blockchain environment. And we basically want to be able to um, uh, enable the design of blockchain architectures that are separate and apart from a use case but also, you know, interface with different blockchains. And this is basically um, uh, being able to interact with our grid emulation environment as well. So we represent a, a use case through close simulation tools, hardware, and software. And then the main thing is to be able to interface between those. So the UTP core is almost like the middle where that sits in the middle that helps with um, you know, whether it be, you know, taking uh, commands and, and, and queries from the blockchain and, and pushing it to uh, grid emulation tools and vice versa, taking, you know, uh, information published um, and, and data requests from the grid emulation tools through to the blockchain and being able to coordinate that um, overall. So, you know, we have an emphasis on things like, you know, connect connectivity, you know, being able to have the interfaces, the communication interfaces, to be able to, you know, um, facilitate incoming and outgoing requests overall. Uh, we have the control and data flow, uh, which is basically uh, enabling the flow of information, you know, from our uh, different uh, grid emulation uh, tools to the blockchain itself, and then extending those interfaces. Uh, to be able to process and route information back and forth. 
um, timing. So again, we have co-simulation tools, we have real hardware, you know, we have, um, you know, different time and, and asynchronous events that are happening. Um, so we want to be able to synchronize all of that timing uh, between, again, the blockchain timing as well for things like consensus, all the way through to, again, uh, grid emulation uh, 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 tools. And then lastly, the last two things here is, you know, we're using UTP to be able to automate uh, the test itself, you know, to be able to, you know, um, uh, change parameters, um, be able to apply and, and see, observe metrics, and then um, be able to actually, you know, uh, see it in a, a dashboard type of a setting. And we're working on that right now. And then lastly, again, this is the full automation, and it's more of a stretch goal uh, for us, but we would love to be able to do a full system automation and data orchestration all throughout um, and have it, you know, be really plug and play. But we're, we're still, um, you know, building out that kind of capability. So, yes, that's it at a nutshell. But again, I'm going to break it down uh, in the subsequent slides. So, basically, again, just remember the three panel structure we have the blockchain side, we have the grid emulation side, and then right in the middle is our UTP core, which is our testing platform itself that allows us to interface between uh, both of those and be able to, you know, at the holistically uh, run a test. So, so let's go into it. And we'll start with uh, DER coordination and control. Okay, so for this use case, it starts with FERC uh, Order uh, 2222. And in that use case, it basically allows uh, DER or, you know, distributed energy resources uh, to aggregate. You know, so all the, the small, like kind of mom and pop, you know, you have a solar on a on a rooftop, you know, how, how you can pool your um, power that you're producing, pool it together and be able to aggregate it so you can participate into wholesale markets. Um, so, again, so the distributed energy resources is basically a small scale um, energy sources that could be in, you know, for example, solar PV uh, or even energy storage such as batteries. And it's in this small, you know, one kilowatt to 10 kilowatt, uh, 10,000 kilowatt, excuse me, uh, range. And again, you know, you're trying to aggregate that up into uh, uh, such that it can, the, the aggregator will then put in bids on their behalf. And, the, you know, bids go to the DSO. In the DSO, they kind of um, uh, 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 evaluate the feasibility of those bids, you know, in terms of grid stability. Um, and then, you know, they may go through modifications and so on and so forth, but then they get a green light. And, you know, it goes to ISO for, for clearance. And, you know, and then the, the ISO is monitoring to make sure, you know, the power that you said you're going to produce, you're actually producing. So I said at a high level, that's, I'm sitting in, I'm, I'm a pure generation girl at heart, so that hopefully I, I summarize that correctly. Um, but that's, you know, the, the overall play here. But think about it, though. You have so many different, um, you know, with decentralized and distributed resources, you have so many different um, um, organizations that are trying to communicate with each other. They're trying to, you know, uh, so you, you have to establish, so the challenges, right? You're trying to establish trust between those multiple parties. And then you're also trying to control the access to those system actors. So, you know, you can't, just to make sure that the integrity of data that's flowing through this entire distributed and decentralized system, you know, in terms of like, you know, bids going in and being uh, modified and then going back and forth and then being cleared, you know, you have to be able to control and co coordinate that, and then you have to be able to scale it up as well, because as more decentralized players come in, it becomes a, a, a factor, you know, order of magnitude, bigger problem. So, um, you know, from our perspective, we think blockchain can help with that, right? I mean, it's like the hero of the story. Um, so blockchain, because of the nature of the technology itself, can help us you know, being able to do flexible access controls and, and addressing grid constraints, you know, in an automated fashion. Um, also addressing uh, tier bypassing, which is basically see, um, uh, when, you know, uh, because aggregators or, or DER can participate now, the DSO has less visibility overall to, for the whole system. And again, they're trying to maintain stability on the grid. Um, so, you know, it, it actually, blockchain can actually help with making sure that information is visible um, throughout the entire process and to help resolve some issues there. 
And then, uh, you know, smart contracts can help with uh, being able to automate some of the uh, um, uh, 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 information flows uh, throughout the system as well. So, so this is the use case kind of uh, summary at a high level, like, you know, what kind of identify what the problem is, what a blockchain can help in terms of solution. So from our perspective, you know, how would you test this, right? <laughs> and that's where it gets good. So the first thing in terms of testing it, you want to be able to emulate this, um, you know, the, the players in the system and even the energy and the power flows and everything that's going on. So let's, so the first piece of being able to test this use case is to do grid emulation. So what we do is take this use case or, or any use case, we're using this as any, the example that we're gonna be demonstrating through this project at least. And what we wanna do is represent this real world system using uh, co-simulation tools, real hardware and software. So what we've done, and, and this is a gross simplification, there's so much work here and there's like, again, 10, 12 people that are been working for two years to try to figure this stuff out. But basically, you know, the DER, we can just, you know, represent that through an open DSS grid simulation package. Um, we can, you know, take all the aggregation um, uh, and, and represent that through uh, DER agents and, and uh, uh, software-based um, aggregators. Then we can mimic the functions of the DSO through a, a grid simulation tool called GridLabD. And then um, uh, as well as, you know, again, we use a, a, a software package called Helix to help with all the timing. Uh, again, all the asynchronous timing that's happening as well. So again, this is a gross simplification such that it is how I see it. Um, uh, but again, at the end of the day, the key takeaway is we can leverage our DOE resources to be able to emulate uh, real world use cases. And we kind of couple it all together. And again, um, and we can actually, you know, we have a working system that mimics this um, and to a, a high degree of fidelity. Okay, so now that we have the grid emulation, we also want to be able to look at the data flows and be able to facilitate that through blockchain. So within our team, we do the same thing. We, we take the information flows and we create, and again, this is one of the breakthroughs as well, um, we create a blockchain architecture that we think is representative that can work, that can be able to facilitate all of the, uh, the uh, information flows for a multi-organizational DER network. So I won't go into it because again, this there's specialty people who have specialized in this within my team, but at a high level, I just want to point out, you know, we can uh, represent this with one channel. And again, we're using Hyperledger fabric uh, for all of our initial um, demonstrations. But the main thing here is that we can represent uh, digitally the roles uh, that participate in a given use case. So we can, we can represent a DER or an, a DER aggregators. We can represent a, a, a DSO. We can represent, and what's not um, uh, mentioned here is we actually have a, a hyper um, representing utility generation uh, in this scenario as well. I didn't put it on the previous picture just for simplicity. But we, we can create within our team, we can actually now create the blockchain architecture that will again facilitate the, the data integrity as you're uh, interacting with all of these organizations and you're trying to share information around a given this this type of a use case. Okay, so now we had the grid emulation uh, previously. Uh -oh. So we had the grid emulation and then we also have the, the blockchain architecture. So then this is kind of, hopefully it's that three panel <laughs> um, um, view of kind of what I showed before that was just so, um, uh, you know, um, boring, right? But this, this to me is where it gets exciting because now, again, you have, you, you're able to, to create a, a, a real world representation of a use case, and then you're able to, to create a blockchain architecture that is, is um, um, serving as the concept under test, right? 
And then what you need is something in the middle to be able to ex help facilitate the exchange and the data flow of that information. So again, if you say, you know, if you, you say you're aggregating bids, you know, at a certain power level, the power level is being informed by the grid simulation tools, right? If you're, um, you know, uh, facilitating bids going on and in, 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 in forth or back and forth, um, you could do that with our UTP core. And that's the, the key of what we're doing. We're, we've built out the testing platform that abstracts, you know, you, you don't have to know anything about, about uh, blockchain um, if you, if you want to test it out. We can test it out for you, right? Or if you come in with a blockchain and you want to say, okay, this is a possible solution for a given use case, we can help you represent that use case. And then the, the full boundary, which is around all three of these, is the test. Um, this is the test profile, right? Now you can run a test. You can actually change parameters. You can run it 50 times and you can, you know, build out acceptance criteria and say, okay, this, under these conditions, this blockchain would work. Under these conditions, this blockchain would not work, right? So it, is, it gets really interesting at this point. So at this point, you know, you're ready <laughs> to conduct a holistic test to evaluate a blockchain and the use case, you know, in, in terms of the scenario and evaluate its performance overall. So yeah, so, so that was just one use case. We're gonna, let's, let's do it again. And, and we'll show you again the full versatility of, of what we've created. Let's talk about the supply chain use case. Okay, so supply chain might be a little bit more accessible to folks on the line. Um, because, you know, it's, it's something that we can easily kind of, uh, uh, it's tangible for us, right? So really, you know, supply chain is just that, you know, you're, you're tracking the life cycle processes of assets. So we, you know, like cell phone, right? I, I probably went online and I uh, looked at a catalog and I purchased this asset, right? And then, you know, along the way, I, I ordered it. I had to install it. It's made it to the computer. You have to install it. It, and then along the way, you might need to verify it. And, and, you know, let's say a vulnerability is detected. Sometimes you have to do a maintenance request or something, like maybe upgrading a software. Um, and then, you know, just along the way, you want to verify that what's on your network is on your network, and then all the way through to decommissioning. Like, okay, it's old. We're going to replace it, right? So from utilities or any industrial process, you know, this is a, t a representation of typical life cycle um, steps, and I'm not going to go through them all, but, uh, you know, again, how can we, when we're trying to test this type of a, a use case, how can we represent it through a blockchain, but also through our grid emulation tools, right? So, again, I'm only going to highlight two quick things, um, just as representative examples. So, the first two steps, you know, uh, publish, so a vendor will probably publish an asset to a catalog. And then somebody, let's say yeah, the, an operator or a utility will have to, will want to order that asset. So this is kind of a blockchain representation of that. <laughs> um, so you have a vendor, they will publish their metadata into what we were call like a manufacturing ledger. Uh, so write it into the blockchain ledger. And then the utility will be able to access that same information because again, it's, it's open and it will be able to, uh, visible to other parties, um, but without, you know, with, uh, with security features where you don't, can't, you know, write and overwrite information, that person can, or that uh, entity can purchase that asset, and then it will go into their operations ledger. So once you, you buy it and you confirm you have it, you put it on your operations ledger, and then it becomes your asset, right? So that's, that's again, a kind of a blockchain representation of these lifecycle uh, asset steps. And then I'm going to skip you know, just kind of go through and skip over to, for example, let's say there is an, an, a vulnerability um, and you have to, and, and so the, uh, uh, there's vulnerability detected and anybody can do that. It could be an ISAC, it could be um, a utility or a vendor or a threat info um, provider uh, that kind of, you know, puts out periodically, like, you know, these things are vulner vulnerabilities or known vulnerabilities. Uh, and then they would then write that to a manufacturing ledger, and then you would get an, you know, we can embed smart contracts that would automatically say, hey, you know, there's a vulnerability detected. 
you need to do a maintenance action. So if it's software, do an upgrade, or if it's hardware, maybe pull it out of service or, or you know, do something with it. So from a utility perspective, then you would be, you know, assess, do a maintenance, assess it, um, you know, is it high risk or low risk, do a maintenance action, and then, you know, re, uh, resolve that vulnerability. And then once you resolve the vulnerability, then you would update the metadata and, and have the most up-to-date information about that asset written into the blockchain. So, yeah. So, so that's, again, just, uh, I just kind of picked and chose what I wanted to highlight, but we, we through this use case, are, have um, um, shown each of these 10 steps in terms of a, a given scenario that will be uh, supported through blockchain. So at a high level, you know, the research goals around this supply chain use case is, you know, using blockchain to be able to, like, answer a few questions. Like, you know, is the, the device that was shipped the same as the, the, the asset that was received? Um, you know, is the one that was deployed in operations the same one that was originally installed? Uh, uh, if, if there is a vulnerability, what's the risk associated with it? Is it high or is it low? Um, and, and then what actions need to occur in terms of maintenance? Um, we can do this for hardware and software uh, subcomponents. And then, um, you know, can we share this information across multiple organizations that are invested, right? They, they might need to know that information. Um, so can we, can we share it without, um, uh, you know, for those who, who have uh, the, the proper access? So that's the use case at a glance. And then I'm just going to jump to it, right? So again, we're trying to figure out how can we uh, take this and test it and evaluate the performance. So again, it's the same thing, right? So for this use case number two or use case number in, we do the same thing. You know, we uh, represent the use case uh, through our grid emulation tools. In this case, it's more simplified because really what we needed was uh, facility with hardware. <laughs> so, and the hardware was again software, uh, embedded systems is like um, microcontrollers and such, and then also hardware uh, like sensors. Um, and we're using our NETL hyper facility to to be able to you know have real world um, build of materials and things like that for software components and subcomponents. And then so we can we can mimic this use case through our DOE resources. And then again, we we uh, with our within our team create a blockchain architecture that you know facilitates the exchange of data and and digitizes the um, the the interactions amongst the different roles. So we have the vendor, like I mentioned before, and that would be publishing an asset to a catalog. We have the utility who's buying that asset. You have uh, threat inf information providers who are publishing vulnerabilities. And then you have um, uh, organizations that just might be interested to make sure that there's compliance or something like that, right? Um, so at this architecture, it's two channels. And again, I'm not going to get into it because again, this is not um, there's other people on my team that just live this and breathe this every day. But at the high level, again, we have the ability again drawing the boundary across the entire thing. We have the ability to. Uh, uh, facilitate with our Blossom UTP, so our Unified Testing Platform, we can facilitate the testing of this new concept in a real-world environment based on DOE resources. And again, isn't it a beautiful thing? So, so that's, that's what we're doing. Again, at this point, you're ready to run a test. Uh oh and My mouth went to sleep because I was talking so much. And I'm, I'm finishing up. And then we'll have time for questions, I promise. Huzzah. <laughs> so yeah, so at this point, you're ready to, to build out a test for, for timing purpose for this, and I wanted to keep it a high level. I'm not gonna go into the metrics. We have dashboards and we're still working it out. We're gonna, again, we're about two months from our final, um, but uh, I wanted to make sure that this audience really locked in on the, the uh, resource that we've created that's in your backyard that you can even use as well. So again, you don't have to have knowledge of a blockchain. We can help you with that, right? You don't have to, if you have knowledge of blockchain, you don't have to have knowledge of the um, uh, grid emulation of, uh, devices, like how to 
build out the use case, we can help you with that as well. And we can help you run the test, right? We can help you facilitate the uh, writing of information to the blockchain and then passing information back and forth as needed um, between, for a given use case, between the grid emulation um, devices and the, the blockchain itself. So, so bring it on home. So what I just showed you, and again, I'm kind of building it up. So we had the UTP and the two use cases. This is basically showing the, the two use cases, but look at the similarities, right? So we did DER, and again, that was basically um, being able to um, facilitate through blockchain the, the uh, wholesale market uh, bid interactions between uh, uh, aggregators and uh, DSOs and ISOs of the world. And then we had the supply chain use case where we're doing life cycle tracking of assets. But no matter, again, we can go use case one, use case two, use case, you know, dot, 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 all the way to, to use case Z, right? It's all going to be looking the same structurally in terms of how to test it. So we'll have the blockchain architecture side where, again, we're enabling the design of blockchain architecture decoupled from, you know, the use case itself. And then we have the ability now to interface with additional blockchains. Because again, right now we're using Hyperledger, but you've seen we've abstracted it away. We, can, if we want to, you know, interface with Ethereum tomorrow, we can. Right? A little bit of modification, but we can do that. And then uh, we could test out, you know, so you can do comparisons at that point. Can you, you know, how does Hyperledger, you know, compare to Ethereum for the same test? capability, and then we have the oppor oppor uh, opportunity to automate it all. So that's, that's the, the blockchain side of the house. And then on the grid emulation, again, you know, it enables us to, to emulate virtually any use case, right? Um, and uh, you can design using the emulation tools, and we have the interfaces, the communication interfaces already, the rails are already there, right? So as we see more looks, as we do more use cases, We'll just be building out this library of capabilities that we can, you know, again, emulate virtually anything. And at the end of the day, we can do it faster. So to reduce the design time to spin up a use case, we'll be able to pull things off the shelf. You know, we're basically, every use case we do, we're building out a library. We can now use that library for future uh, use cases to be able to emulate virtually anything. And then, of course, uh, the, the, the main attraction is the UTP, the core in the middle, and that's where all the magic happened. There's just a ton in these boxes, but I, I just want to keep it at a high level. But, you know, it, it has the, the platform itself, the testing platform itself, has enabled us to decouple from the grid emulation side, so the use case application, and decouple from the blockchain itself. And we can, we can swap out those at will. Um, and then we can, you know, confirm the, you know, it, we've simplified the message passing and the information exchange between the two. Um, and then we have uh, have now the ability to, to, to deploy automated testing. We do automated metrics collection as well uh, to be able to evaluate the performance of these use cases. I mean, this really gets interesting. And then I think I have just one more slide, two more slides. So the next steps, you know, we're not done yet, but we have two more. We're about to end in June. So we're about to, we're gearing up and we're doing our final kind of sprint to try to make sure that we can do the final end-to-end -end, uh, testing for both use cases. We've, we've done end-to-end, -end, but we want to, you know, knock it out the park. So we, we want to do it with the final integration of all of our target resources. We're finalizing our dashboards. I didn't even show them today, but there's, for every test we run, there are dashboards and performance metrics that you can see that you know uh, allows you to follow the outcomes of the test, right? Um, and then we're doing additional outreach. So this is an example of outreach we're trying to do to amplify, make sure people know that it's out there. Because again, you know, I can see you know small business owner, academic institution, others. If you're looking for um, testing, or if you're even looking for just advice or subject matter expertise, you know, you have it here in your area um, overall. Uh, and then you know, following our, we're trying to explore what's next, right? So we're going to try to continue to expand the library of our grid emulation capabilities. Um, and again, leveraging what's already available through our DOE National Lab resources. Um, but then, you know, we're exploring additional collaborations with industry or academia or, or others to, such that we can do more use cases 
Um, so some things that have come up recently are things like um, tracking of raw materials. Uh, that's a very big one, um, especially for things like, you know, electronics waste and things like that. You know, lithium ion batteries keep coming up. Um, but we're also, so the second thing would be, so, I mean, so the natural extension of the supply chain use case could be used for tracking of raw materials, rare earth elements, things like that. Um, we're also looking to explore controls of like hybrid uh, integrated uh, energy systems. And then, you know, energy consumption keeps coming up, right? We want to make sure um, we're going to start, uh, we want to make sure that our testing platform allows us to be able to um, evaluate the energy consumption for a given blockchain concept, for a given use case or application as well. And that's going to be very interesting for us moving ahead. And then the last thing I'll say is to wrap it all up and go to questions. And I'm sorry, I went a little bit long. Um, but, uh, you know, what we have here is a first of a kind testing platform um, that enables us to do systematic evaluation of blockchain based concepts for grid applications. Um, it is interoperable, it's reconfigurable. It's reusable, <laughs> um, and we can demonstrate a wide variety of use cases, um, as well as a wide variety of different blockchain uh, environments as well. And then, um, you know, again, I started this way, I'm going to end this way, but testing and demonstration, it reduces the risk of blockchain technologies. Um, and again, as we're testing and we're putting it through its paces under real world conditions, you know, we're building confidence and we're driving down risk. And if we do that properly, like I said before, then we can accelerate the, the, the concept. So these new fangled things, right, we're, we're actually putting it through its paces. And then we that way, when something does show up on your doorstep and say, hey, I have a solution for you, <laughs> you can have a little bit of a high, at least a higher level of degree that that uh, uh, is something that is valid and viable and, and worthy of your attention if it gets to you, right? And so, so you can possibly adopt it in the future. And then lastly, you know, again, you know, we are DOE. This is, you know, we're taxpayer funded. We're stewards of the taxpayer dollars. We, you know, there are DOE resources that we're gonna, you know, kind of repurpose and, you know, bring in and start and continue to build out our library of capabilities that we can continue to um, be able to, um, uh, uh, do more in terms of demonstrations, more use cases, and basically just grow in capability and the whole time leveraging resources overall. Um, and that is all. So at, at the end of the day, I want to say a big thank you um, to again, Matt and, and Anthony for inviting me along, um, but also thank you to the team. Everything you saw today and even some questions I can't answer, <laughs> it comes from the team and the work that they've done. Um, and again, it's a dream team. If they're on the line, you know, I say I say it to them all the time. You know, what we're doing is is impressive, and I think uh, we should all be proud. I think maybe let's try. So, and one thing, other thing is that the uh, chat isn't working for some reason in this new update. They have a Q and A portion, which is interesting. Sure. Um, can you guys see the slide, the blockchain slide that that is up? Just yes, curious. we can see it. Okay, great. Um, all right, so why don't we do this? Why don't we just do uh, a couple questions just a little bit about uh, workforce. Um, so an economic development tied to blockchain. So probably most simplistically, what do you see as kind of the, the roles and occupations necessary to kind of bring this type of uh, blockchain technology to energy cybersecurity? up and down the pipeline of either professional, like professional degrees like yourself, like R&D and scientists, mm -hmm. all the way down to perhaps even the technical level, like what types of occupations or what type of jobs do you think that would be relevant for this type of um, new industry, essentially? Yeah, I mean, good question. I um, That's a good question. <laughs> I should have been able to anticipate that, but let me say, these days, I would say, I mean, and again, know the source, I, I'm very big into digital technologies and, and I love this kind of stuff, but I think, you know, the future is digital, right? Um, you know, we, over the past couple of years, if not the past decade, you know, it's, it's been called the digital transformation, right? 
um, and uh, things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, you know, um, everything, cloud services, everything has these days an aspect of IT, networking, and digitization is in general. Sorry, there's uh, yard work outside, so sorry if it's loud. Um, but so I'll just say, you know, follow your passion, but if you can add an and to it, like do, so these days, you know, even if you, let's say you're a materials person, you know, it, it, it wouldn't hurt to have, you know, in terms of your skill set and some data science background or some, you know, how to manipulate data, how to, um, again, artificial intelligence and machine learning, how, just, you don't have to, if it's not your passion, if you don't have to know how to do it, but just know of it, know of the capabilities, um, such that you can get the right people right in place. Um, but yeah, data science, um, being able to, you know, I found even in my work, it would be very helpful to me to know an, an IT stack, right? <laughs> And I'm a mechanical engineer trained, um, and I ended up into this realm. So, you know, just at the end of the day, the, the main thing is, in terms of skills, the number one skill that served me well is to, is to, to um, the ability to keep learning. So that's number one, and stay open. And then, if even if you don't like something, again, you I follow your passion. If you if you're not passionate about it, that's okay, but be aware of it, such that you can then interface and. Um, you know, have a team because again, you don't have to. Everything's interdisciplinary these days. You don't have to have know everything about every single subset of a of a of a uh, skill set. It's it's mainly being able to uh, stay open and then bring in help as it's needed. But again, I would say, yeah, the, the future is digital, so it doesn't hurt to know about a little bit about digital technologies overall. Hopefully, well, that, I mean, I was just kind of meandered in that no, answer, no, no, but it's... yeah. That's perfect. And so uh, I do, I'm trying to figure this out as, as well, but we do have the Q&A function. You can ask a question and then we can try to field it. But uh, I also want to encourage people, this is a very, very like, you know, hot, you know, topic, blockchain and cybersecurity, that if they have any questions, any questions at all, you can always reach us at netl.rwfi at netl.doe.gov or by looking for our contact information at netl.doe.gov slash rwfi. I wanted to give Anthony a little bit of time to if he had any questions or any comments. Well, I don't have any questions, but I learned a lot. Um, and I will say this, I, I appreciate Sydney taking the time to, to run through this at a higher level. I, I There's so much about this blockchain stuff that I wasn't super familiar with. and. Um, Really grateful for you to take the time to, to inform all of us about this today. No problem. Again, thank you for having me. Again, uh, if anybody has any questions or even follow on or just wants to know more, um, if you're a small business owner and you're looking to, to uh, you know, you've heard about it and you want to know, like, how can this work for you, feel free to reach out, you know, and, and if I don't have the answer, I can help direct traffic uh, overall. And again, thank you to my team. I see a few of you on the line. Um, I appreciate it. And again, uh, you know, let's, let's keep going. Yeah, I guess that's one thing that I wish we had a little bit more time to talk about, but the economic development implications of having the, I guess, the, the, the DERs, I guess, are a really good example of that. So that like, you know, mm -hmm. even you, if you have a, a, a battery in your garage, you may be able to latch onto the blockchain and through accounting magic, get some slice of a, uh, some some cash from 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 exactly. uh, distributed energy, yes. right? Is that correct? No, exactly. Yeah. Yes, most definitely. And and it's and again, you know, technologies like blockchain will help hopefully uh, reduce some of the barriers. Because again, right now with this, you know, they want more people to be able to participate because they're just reading the room, right? You know, people are are installing these systems and they they want to you know push power back into the grid. Um, you know, and participate in the full, you know, marketplace of things. So technologies like blockchain can help facilitate that. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, you you yourself don't need to know, like, I mean, I drive a car every day. I don't need to know every system, some in subsystem that's, you know, getting me from point A to point B, but just to be aware, right? And hopefully if it does, like of, of what's going on in the back end, and when it does get to come to fruition, it's because of hopefully testing platforms such as ours that helps 
facilitate these types of things along the way, right? Um, and, it, and, and again, if you are somebody who is interested and you don't know anything, we've, again, with our testing capability, we've removed out, like, you don't need to know about blockchain to be able to test a blockchain concept, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, so it's open from that perspective overall. But, yeah, um, you know, hopefully, I mean, the future is interesting. And, and the way we interact, I mean, even now, like, the way we, you know, the past few years of COVID, it's unfortunate. And again, you know, prayers up to, it's been a long road. But, you know, to be able to interface with people across the entire world, I mean, you know, in the 19, what, 70s and 80s, this would be a dream, right? <laughs> so, I mean, we're living in the future, but even now there's still things that, that are coming, right? Um, and it's just, I mean, you know, we should be enjoying it because it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, thank you, Sydney. Thank you, Anthony. I think we had a really great conversation today and looking forward to all the collaborative efforts that hopefully this engenders. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye.